Welcome everybody to this Zoom session on infused oils from the Medicinal Forest Garden. The presentation is about 40 slides and we'll be addressing a range of issues to do with infused oils. I'm going to take us through some introductory explanations on herb oil infusions and and I'll be discussing some of the plant species that can be used. I'll talk about sourcing carrier oils and I'm going to include a, a, a basic recipe for infusing oil. Whoops. Oh, sorry. I think I <laughs> I trod on trod on my <laughs> forward button. I'll try not to do that again. And I will also give a recipe for making a balm, which is also in the Medicinal Forest Garden Handbook. And, and I'll talk about some further sources. Okay, so. So first of all, a few words about me. I'm Anne Stobart, I'm a, a medical herbalist and teacher, researcher and grower. And when I came to Devon some 30 years ago, I trained in permaculture and that got me started on thinking about growing my own herbs for my own clinical practice. And although I've retired now, that led to lots of exciting things, including publishing a book, the Medicinal Forest Garden Handbook, which was based on our experiences. Is a picture of me at Holtwood, which is a project in Devon where we grew medicinal trees and shrubs and a lot more between 20, let's see, 2005 and 2020. So we've since disposed of the wood during lockdown and became problematic to carry on. So although the wood doesn't exist anymore as a visitable place, the Medicinal Forest Garden Handbook captures a lot of what we learnt. I'm I think permaculture is great. And one of the things that's particularly great about it is the three ethical principles of permaculture, which is that our projects, our designs, our lives should be good for the planet. They should be good for the people. For our... And finally, where there are profits or uh, produce or whatever, we should they, those should be fairly shared. So that's where I'm coming from. So. And just briefly, well, many of you are probably very familiar with this idea of forest gardening. Sometimes people refer to food forests. And essentially, forest gardens are projects based on perennial plantings in, in layers, lots of layers, from overstory trees to understories, shrubs, perennials, climbers, ground cover, and below ground roots even designed to be sustainable and productive and lots more and there are lots of principles of design which can be learnt about on permaculture training courses through the Permaculture Association and worldwide and um, of course the food forest is quite likely to contain many medicinal plants in fact many food plants are quite medicinal but on my interest is to look at all the other uses apart from food. And on the left, we have a, a young birch tree, leaves and bark, very useful for, for medicine, powerful antiseptic and, and diuretic. So we've got plenty of native trees. We've also got uh, many introduced plants. And on the right, there's a bee snuggling into the flower of Oregon grape, which is a North American species. And one of the things that I did at Holtwood, the Medicinal Tree and Shrub Project, was discover how many of those plants would actually grow very well in this country. In fact, many of them are ornamentals. The uh, Oregon grape itself is a, a, a wonderful plant that grows really well in shade, has edible but bitter berries, which can be used to make a jelly. But the, the main medicinal use is the bark, which is very useful, often thought of as a, a cleanser because it has quite deep cleansing function working on the liver and useful for many skin complaints. And there's a lot more about these, these plants in, in the book. 
So just to summarize, as a result of my experiences, when I retired from seeing patients, I started to promote the Medicinal Forest Garden Trust. And so there is an online website and this is the front page. And that's what I'm looking to develop and grow. And, and I welcome people getting in touch if they're, they're interested in getting involved in that. But essentially it's all about including trees and shrubs along permaculture lines. So, all about making herb oil infusions. This is a wonderful way of using the benefits of plants. It's such a simple way and in many ways very safe. And we're talking about probably a lot of remedies that can be used externally rather than internally. And I'm going to talk about herbs infused in carrier oils. I'm not going to talk about essential oils and distillation. That's a huge topic, deserves a whole other session. So the focus here is on what we would call carrier oils. Um, they are essentially often pressed from seeds and other vegetable products and they are quite good keeping, they are very nourishing and repairing for the skin very often. They can moisturize, help to hold water in, improve the skin barrier. They can provide nutrients, some of them, to help skin repair. And of course, the skin is a major element of our body's defense mechanisms. So that's quite important not to be, not to be sniffed at. It's also quite interesting that, that herb oils give herbal practitioners like myself, clinical herbal practitioners, some commonality with other practitioners like aromatherapists, which I think are really good bridges to, to build. So looking at making herb oils, probably is one of the easiest kind of remedy to make a herb oil, because all you really need are the, the two things in the center, a jug for mixing and some jars or bottles, for preferably dark glass, for putting the oils into. But if you want to be looking at making herb oils and other products for sale, or if you want to be more accurate, you're going to need measuring cylinders. And uh, on the right, you're going to need perhaps other things like sources of warmth and stirring rods, pans, all sorts of things can be used. But essentially, there's not a lot needed. There, there are a couple of extra things that you would find very useful, and that, that includes a ban marie, which is a, a saucepan that sits on top of another saucepan, which can be filled with boiling water and maintains a, a, a good gentle heat. And the other thing that's extremely useful is a source of muslin or, or cloth, tea towels, for example, old tea towels, never throw them away. Old pillowcases, never throw them away. They can be very useful, not just for collecting plants, but also for straining, straining and pressing oil. And essentially, you're going to need a source of heat. Those of you who've got wood burners can use them, but, but any sources of heat from the sun on a windowsill to a gas or electric stove is fine. So I'm gonna start off just by talking about the basic infusion. This is a, uh, I'm gonna talk through a recipe for calendula infused oil. Calendula or English marigold calendula officinalis is in the daisy family. It's quite bitter, it's edible, the flowers are, are edible, but it's also stuffed full of resinous and aromatic constituents. And the, the resins are not just in the flowers. In fact, you could also use leaves and stems, but generally people focus on the flowers, which are rich in carotenoids. So they produce a lovely yellow coloring in the, the finished product. So this is gonna be great, this oil for a whole range of 
nasty, dry, ouchy skin complaints from cracked nipples to athlete's foot. So uh, the resinous content is antibacterial, but the oil is also anti-inflammatory. However, as with all herbal remedies, check the cautions. And one caution is not really to use this on open wounds because excluding air may not be helpful on, on an open wound. Now, the thing about marigold is that once you've got it, you'll never be alone. It will rapidly flower and seed in any gardens. It prefers a sunny spot. And the most important thing to remember is that if you have flowers, you need to pick them weekly because if you don't, they'll go to seed and stop flowering. You can leave them to go to seed and you could possibly use the seed, but most people use the flowers. Once you've picked the flowers and you can pick them with a bit of stem, they could be laid out or on a single layer, on kitchen towel, on a tray, placed in an airy location to dry. Now, the reason that I talk about drying is that avoiding moisture content gives you better keeping qualities in the, in the infused oil. And for marigold infused oil, I would recommend using sunflower seed oil, but you can use many of other oils. So once you've got your dry flowers, you can remove the flower, petals from the flowers, or you can use the, the flowers whole, put them into a, a jar, whatever size jar you've got available, and add sunflower oil to cover the flowers. I find that a couple of good handfuls of dried flowers is about right for a litre of, of sunflower oil. Good idea to keep the container because then you can put the oil when it's done back into the original bottle. So this jar of flowers with oil can be left on a sunny windowsill or you can speed things up with a bain-marie. So this is a bain-marie on our gas stove and you can see the, the, the flowers are quite pressed down and oil has been added. In this lower part is water which is steaming away. You probably need to top up if you're only filling this pan a little. It will, even though there's a lid on it effectively with the upper saucepan, steam will escape and it will dry out. I usually stand this bain-marie on a low heat for up to an hour and you'll get a wonderful smell of the resins getting into the oil. So if you haven't got a bain-marie, you can do this in a pan inside a, uh, a, a, or a bowl inside a larger pan in boiling water. And essentially the effect of the warmth is to break down the plant cells and so the active constituents can seep into the oil. If you don't do it this way, you can put the jar with oil and flowers on a windowsill for maybe four weeks, give it a shake now and then. So then we strain and bottle up the, the oil. You can strain through a tea towel or muslin and then pour into a bottle. It's important always to label with the plant and the date, the plant name. And if you've done it with dried flowers, then you're likely to be able to keep this oil for a good three to six months. If you use fresh flowers, then you're likely to have some gunk underneath your oil because oil floats on water and the keeping qualities will be less good. So once you've got a calendula infused oil, you can do a lot of other things. But hot wood, we used it mainly to make a marigold balm. And I'll be giving a balm recipe shortly, but essentially the balm is a thicker mixture 
It contains something, a butter like cocoa butter, could be shea butter, beeswax, and there are vegan alternatives, and a few drops of an essential oil to help act as an antioxidant. So this was one of our most popular products at Hold Herbs. And so we found that we could grow marigolds very easily, so long as we had a sunny location. And these recipes will work for most other plants. I'm going to look at some other plants. This is, this is Sanford Millennium Green in Devon, where I'm helping to refurbish a, a rather overgrown herb garden and forest garden. And you can see here, we've got flower beds and in the background, uh, shrubs and trees, including particularly willow. If anybody's in the area and you're interested in getting involved in this project, by all means, get in touch. So this is an ideal combination location for many of the plants that I'm talking about because many of them are aromatic and so they do derive a lot of benefit from a sunny or not too shady location, including comfrey. So comfrey, symphytum officinal, very much a gardener's friend and can be used in lots of ways, another wonderful multifunctional plant. And so we tend to use the leaves for infusing. And you can see here that the infused oil has become very nice and green. This is again infused in, in sunflower oil and using the same process that I just described for the marigold infused oil. And a key constituent of the comfrey plant, especially the leaf, is allantoin, which particularly helps with the anti-inflammatory and healing effects. The leaf should be picked when it's young and fresh, and you might be able to spot the deliberate mistake in this slide here, because as soon as the flowers start to come, the leaves will start to go over. So ideally, you should be picking, when well, you're picking leaves, just before flowering is probably the time of maximum constituents. Again, I would re thoroughly recommend, this is a very watery plant, drying it off before using it to make an infused oil. Looking at other plants that are probably likely to be found in forest gardens, birch that I mentioned at the beginning, it's an ideal component of infused herb oils and many balms. It's another antiseptic and offers good anti-inflammatory effects. It's particularly thought of in treating sore joints and muscles. This raises a question about how much of the active ingredients are likely to be absorbed through an infused oil, which is applied, say, to a joint or, or a muscle. And looking at this in the past, I think probably about 10% of the quantity that's in the oil or balm is likely to be infused. So it's quite low amounts. And this is one of the reasons why herb infused oils are very safe to use and can be used repeatedly because they will be adding small amounts all the time and they'll be well absorbed through the fatty acids in the oils on the skin. So this is a great one for cellulitis and a method not using the Ban Marie would be to take these crumbled herbs, dried, dried leaf and catkins actually, this one, put them in a jar, cover them, stir well with oil. Don't put a lid on, but just place a piece of muslin on the top with an elastic band or tied, and then leave that on a sunny wind, windowsill. Give a, a stir every now and then. If the plant material tends to pop up above the oil, then take a clean, very well washed stone or a smaller jar weighted with, with liquid in it to press those, those leaves down again. If they come to the surface, particularly if not completely dry, then they'll tend to blacken and oxidize. Bit like rust, really. 
So leave that in a sunny spot or use the bain-marie, leave that in a sunny spot for up to four weeks or so and then strain and infuse. And I'm going to give a recipe for a balm in, involving birch buds a few slides further on. Also growing in the forest garden, maybe eucalyptus. This is, will grow extremely well and has very shallow roots, so can be problematic and may need to be coppiced or pollarded and pr pruned repeatedly. Of course, that's why forest gardens are ideal, because there's plenty of leaves from coppicing and pollarding if it's done in the spring and these can be dried off to use. This is snow gum, Eucalyptus pulsiflora, and it's a possibly a smaller <laughs> eucalyptus, so maybe a better one in the forest garden context. And again, the leaves can be stripped and dried and then perhaps shredded or crumbled and about four cups of leaf in a crock pot is another method um, covered with oil and then put on the lowest setting for four to six hours then the oil can be strained off and, and labeled this is great for a chest rub and probably any eucalyptus species will give us the same effect eucalyptus of course is also extremely useful as an insect repellent so again another multifunction plant great for the forest garden I have to mention St John's wort. It has a very long tradition of use for skin complaints, although more recently clinical practitioners like myself use it for, have used it for treating depression. It has a very positive effect on liver action as well. But we're not talking about St John's wort internally. Here we're talking about St John's wort externally. And if you look very closely at, trying to find an example here, at the flowers and also the leaves and stems, you'll see little black dots. You might be able to see some dotted around <laughs> on these plants. They're not dots, they're glands and they're full of an active ingredient, very dark active ingredient. And that's the one that we're looking for to infuse into an oil. Uh, this is an excellent remedy for inflamed nerves, and particularly the oil is used for treating problems like shingles externally. The flower comes late in the year and it tends to come in over a period of a number of weeks. So the way that this oil is made is that the flowers are picked to encourage more flowers to come, usually in July going through to August, mine is still flowering and they're put in a jar and then oil is added, muslin or kitchen towel can be used with an elastic band on the top and more flowers are added as they come. So this is one that is quite often used or made with, with fresh flowers so that when in, the oil has turned a, a, a lovely deep red color, then the flowers can be strained off, take care to leave behind the mucky mush at the bottom of the jar because that's the bit that will make the oil go off more quickly. So this is also a good oil for cold sores and it will keep very well actually. So I have St John's wort oil, this is at least two years old and it's still going strong. Most infused oils, as I said before, perhaps three to six months, maximum a year. And here's the making of the oil. You can see the flowers are gradually filled up in this kiln jar. I use quite a lot of kiln jars, they're good size for me, but jam jars are fine too. And this lid would not be used in making this. The, the top would be covered with a some sort of tissue or muslin. Okay, another possibility, Sweet Bay, wonderful, wonderful member of the Laurel family. Sweet Bay is, is a fantastic digestive, but it 
is great for arthritic pain and sore muscles in an infused oil. Note that there can be some confusion in terminology. For example, essential oil of bay is distilled from the leaves, a very strong extract. And then there's a bay berry pressed oil, which is a carrier oil. And so there are a number of different types of oils and it, we need to be clear when we're talking about them. But what I would do with these leaves, I would scrunch them up, crackle, if they're dry, they'll, they'll crack easily and put them in a jar, cover them with the oil, let them stand for a, a good period. Scrunching the, the dried leaves helps in the breakdown of the active ingredients and it helps to encourage them to go into the infused oil. Okay, and of course, rosemary, again, probably best in a, a sunny spot to maximize the aromatic ingredients. But rosemary is effectively a, a stimulant. It's used in lots of remedies to stimulate blood flow as well as in edible contexts. And it's probably the infused oil is best known for hair growth. <laughs> so I'm just checking the, the chat and we certainly will answer the questions at the end. So can be applied direct to the scalp. It's quite nice to mix it with something like a, a black pepper in infusion, something that's a, quite stimulating and can be left on the scalp overnight, perhaps wrap your head in a towel and, and then shampooed off in the morning. So that will encourage circulation to the surface of the skin. So that's why it's probably recommended for hair growth, but the same for other parts where you're looking to encourage extra circulation in the skin. So we're getting towards the end of the plants now, a few more. Myrtle in a, a sheltered spot, myrtle, quite similar in many ways to sweet bay, is a beautiful multifunction plant. Again, edible berries, the leaves can be dried for teas. And it's safe for use on the skin, but brings in another caution here, which is that where there are aromatic components, in general, it's not recommended for use with children or in pregnancy or breastfeeding without some professional advice. The herb infused oils are probably the safest to use because they're not as strong as the distilled essential oils though. And then looking at Scots pine and of course lots of coniferous plants. These are sometimes out of reach so you might be looking at windy weather such as we're getting right now and branches falling to the ground and gathering the needles. If you can get Douglas fir they're particularly aromatic and, and wonderful. I would suggest with pine to strip the leaves and bruise or chop them into smaller pieces, pack into a jar and then cover with oil in a similar way. To, to the previous recipes and then strain, discard the leaf matter as in previous recipes, it can go into compost and label and store it in a cool dark place. This is quite antiseptic, this oil, so it'd be good, probably store very well in a cool dark place. And it's one that will work really well with other warming and spicy herbs. So you can add other spices when you're infusing, such as a stick of cinnamon or perhaps cloves, and then use the oil for feet, sore feet. Use it on the chest, particularly for bronchial problems. Also on the neck and shoulder in a massage. And then lastly in the plants, there are Lots more aromatic plants, too many probably to mention, but including lavenders and sages. If you've got sunny areas, they're uh, particularly useful. 
I've just noticed that on the right, I've got not a, so much a, a sage, but actually I think this is self-heal growing quite tall with, with similar looking flowers. So these this self-heal is in the mint family. And so any plants in the mint family can be infused readily in oils. Thyme is another particularly antiseptic one. These plants all need to be regularly cut back to encourage not, not too straggly a growth. So again, a great advantage, take the prunings, dry them, and then you can lose them to make infused oils later on. Okay, incidentally, these, particularly the, the lavenders and rosemaries, sages, make wonderful preservatives if they're, if you can get them as essential oils. And the general rate of adding will be about 1%, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly in talking about preservatives. So let's move on and think about your oil sources. On the left, supermarket sunflower oil, heavily processed probably, and actually has very good keeping qualities. On the right, one of my favorite suppliers, an aromatherapy supplier, very good quality sources. And notice that I always write on the labels when they arrive, the date that they received. And that's quite important if you're trying to manage some sort of stock control, keeping your oils nice and fresh. So external oils, sunflower, uh, sweet almond, grape seed, olive, coconut oil are all fine for external use. Buying organic, probably more appropriate for food and edible purposes. Obviously there are extra costs. It's better to know the provenance of your oils, but there may also be faster deterioration in organic oils because they contain so many ingredients. So it's kind of important to think about the purpose really, of what you want, if you want something that will keep well, or whether you want to do things that are better for the planet by buying organic. So there are other specialist oils like the rosehip seed oil, which are particularly rich in nutritious elements for, for skin. And these are usually quite a lot more expensive and also used in dilution. So if I was making up a mixed preparation, I might put in maybe something like 10% rosehip seed oil as an extra nutrition for, for, the, for the skin. Okay, so these are not essential oils, these are all carrier oils. And you might want to consider growing your own. This is sunflowers at the allotment. If you're gonna grow your own, you're gonna need an oil press. I'll just say a little bit about that. These sunflower seeds, ideally you need the black ones because they are the richest in oils. And these are not, these are actually striped sunflower seeds. They'll probably be used for edible purposes or possibly for the birds. And you're gonna need an oil press. This is a Petiba oil press in, in action. Just, I'm just gonna go back a moment to my sunflowers. So how to tell when the sunflowers are ripe and ready to, to harvest. If you look at the back of the sunflower head, you'll see that it goes from green to yellow and the flower petals will start to shrivel back. And that's when you can take off the top of the stem, I would usually cut lower down and, and allow the ripening to finish off in the house. Otherwise, you may find that as the seeds begin to ripen, if they fall out, that they'll be taken by birds. The, the stem can be cut off and you can place it upside down in a paper bag to allow it to, to fully ripen. And I've just got a, an example of a one that's been drying in the house and what you'll find is that the, the seeds will rub off readily and then they can be 
uh, laid out in a, in a thin layer just to dry a little and then stored, uh, ideal to store them in a cloth bag such as a, a pillowcase or something like that. Now, the Petiba oil press can tackle some flower seeds with their coats on, but it's not ideal. And so if you're trying this out, you're probably best starting off with hulled seeds. It's hand cranked, but it can be mechanized. This is the crank here, and well, the crank handle is on the right. Inside this tube, there is a ginormous screw which turns with the crank, and down below are some big nuts and bolts to hold the thing solid on a table because a very large amount of pressure is generated as you crank. And the seeds are fed in through this top opening. There's a small, this is running on, I think it's methylated spirit flame that heats this area. So you can see a slightly blackened area. And then there's a screw at the end, which kind of can be altered to the kind of nuts and seeds that are being used. And this is the remains of, it's either sunflowers or walnuts, I can't quite remember. So this is the Petiba oil press, and you can reckon on getting something like 25 to 40% of oil from your seeds. And here it is in action with walnuts being fed in from the top. The, uh, this pulp comes out the bottom at the end. If you do treat yourself to one of these, you're looking at maybe, I think probably about 120 pounds. They come from Europe. And uh, one of the things you learn very quickly is that you must, when you stop feeding through oil, dismantle this area because the cake, oil cake pressing, which can be composted or, or reused for bird food and the like, this becomes very solid very quickly. And on the left, you can see it from the other side. This is the oil coming through from the walnuts above. And it's a very turgid looking oil, but it does settle within a couple of days. So walnuts are probably the highest oil producers. So if you've got a source, that's brilliant. I would say that this process takes a, quite a lot of effort and it's not one that I would use on a, on a regular basis, but it's great to know that it's possible. Okay, and here are some examples of the produce on the left is the walnut oil, having settled after a few days. In the middle, a slightly greener color is the sunflower seed oil. And on the right is olive oil that's been used for cooking chips, which as you can see, it's quite hard to tell the difference. And so again, it depends on the purpose that you want to use your oil for and how much time and money you've got, I suppose. I think, I would love to see more oil production in this country. And I think the one that I would be really keen to see is hazelnut oil. Because hazelnuts grow so well, if you can stop them being taken by the, the squirrels. And hazelnut oil is particularly thought of as being good for the hair and for beards. So, while this might not be an economic prospect at the moment, it may be useful to know. So once you've got your infused oils, you can go on and make balms, as I mentioned earlier. And these are infused calendula oil balms with added cocoa butter and beeswax and a few drops of rosemary essential oil that were made as lip waxes when we were doing hot wood and this is great for yourself but also as possible value added products that can be easily made and are very very popular. Oops. So if you're looking at making your own balms you're going to need something like shea butter this is from the soap kitchen beeswax which is often available locally 
and this is cocoa butter and you can get some great sources of cocoa butter but obviously come a, a warmer climate there is an alternative to beeswax which is vegan and that is uh, carnauba or, or candelilla wax and apparently they are even stiffer beeswax offers a lot of stiffening properties so can be used in smaller quantities if you're buying from supplies then please do look for fair trade certification or organic certification And here's an image for making birch bud and bay leaf balm. These are the bay leaves dried and these are the birch buds. Birch buds take quite a long time to harvest, but they're little power packed containers of antiseptic and resinous anti-inflammatory effects. And the recipe, so we've got the jars, we've got the bain-marie, and shea butter is here and it's in the medicinal forest garden handbook so the quantities are something in the region of your oil and half as much wax and butter the more wax you add you can go up to double the stiffer the mixture the more butter you add, the quicker it will melt onto the skin. This quantity will make around 10, 30 mil jars. And you need, first of all, to infuse the sunflower oil in your plants. You can take the plant out before adding the butter and beeswax, or you can leave it in. And then when everything's melted up, then strain off the buds and leaves for compost and then pour the oil into jars. You might need to experiment with whether or not to warm your jars. Sometimes if you pour into cold jars, you get a certain amount of crazing or cracking on the surface of the balm, which is fine if you're using it yourself, but not necessarily ideal if you want to sell or give away. I've put at the bottom here that this keeps for one to two months. In fact, I'm using this balm still, which I made last year, and I'm using it as a, a lip salve, and it's absolutely fine. The essential oils in the, in the plants will help to keep everything well. So I'm just going to finish off now with a half a dozen more slides talking about some issues if you're making these products for sale or thinking about it and also where to get supplies and and more information so here's a a, a wonderful range of possibilities if from the forest garden you can not only make oils but you can also think about syrups teas ciders and vinegars and dried herbs generally but there's one thing that I would say, and that is that you really, really need to be aware of your market and you don't want to be spending all your time trying to sell the stuff you make. So if you're going this way, please think about where you're going to market and how successful that's going to be. The markup on these products is, is very good. You get a good return for your efforts but you need to be able to sell. So this is a, an example of a label that we started out with at Holtwood, a plain label, which you can print on a, a color label print, a color printer onto uh, sheets of labels. And then we started to develop labels on a specific printer which offered the possibility of a much sharper image. And also you can see here on the back, our, these were our constituent labels. We had recipes safety assessed so that we could sell cosmetics. And this, these labels gave advice about best before use, constituents and any cautions. 
So we were able to put them on the back and the front. This is, those labels were actually produced on a, a, a printer, which costs quite a few hundred pounds. But once you've got that printer, then you can print your own labels. So if you're thinking of marketing, you have to be sure that you're going to do no harm by getting your recipes assessed. You probably have to think about training so that you know how to make these things. And you need to keep a fresh stock of ingredients. And you need to think about preservation. This is a, a little quarter teaspoon of rosemary extract. If you want products to last, then you are going to have to look at added some, adding something like this at about 1%. So that's maybe 20 drops in 100 ml of your mixtures. You can also use other antioxidants like vitamin E. If you have water in your products, then you're going to have to look at more serious preservatives. And there, there are courses uh, in person online, which I'll mention uh, at the end, suppliers of those courses that can train you. In particular, if you're looking at preservatives, you want to be looking at websites for places like Ara from places like Aromantic and Naturally Thinking as starting points. And if you're looking at good quality supplies, I mentioned Bay House Aromatics at the beginning. There's also uh, Tree Harvest, which supply a very wide range of, of items. If you're thinking about training more in herbal medicine, then perhaps you might want to look at the National Institute of Medical Herbalists. So I'm just going to paste those links into the chat for people who might be struggling to copy them all. And, and then you can make a copy of those and paste them into the chat. If I can find a way to do it. Oh, here we are. Right, okay. There we go. You can also find out more about the sorts of things I'm talking about, the, the trees and shrubs and their medicinal uses. We've got some online courses and our Thinkific website gives you plenty more details and also you can see some free previews if you, if you sign up. Um, if you're looking at those courses then possibly and you like making things, the harvest course is the one that focuses on sustainable and quality harvesting and making things. A design focuses on how to establish a medicinal forest garden or medicinal plants within another context. And then the most recent one, which has just been put online, the healing properties of medicinal trees, which talks all about the different ways in which they can be used. Okay. And that's the first, in the first, in the course about medicinal trees and their healing properties, which starts off by looking at aromatics and um, forest bathing. But those courses cost £45, but there's a free preview so you can see if, if you want to do them online. So um, to conclude, I wish everybody happy herb oil infusing and I just reaffirm really why I think herb oils shouldn't be dismissed because they're great for people for all these many reasons for uh, benefiting the skin the aromatics are great for mood particular healing properties and helping particular parts ranging from hair beards to feet elsewhere and very many of the the plants are antiseptic so they're, they're quite useful in that respect for the planet I'd love to see us using less preservatives in body care, making our own items, uh, uh, introducing more 
both native and introduced plants that can be used. And of course, these remedies are more likely to be biodegradable. But I just want to focus briefly on the third ethical principle of permaculture and, and hope that we can share the learning about these self-help items and also the warnings about cautions about what can and can't be used, that we can encourage more self-help. We can also encourage small scale makers. There's a massive demand out there. I don't think we'll be competing with each other if we had some of these body care remedies sold from every forest garden. We can also support less well-developed countries by ordering organic supplies of, of particular things like shea butter. And these items can be made together. So they're a good focus for community projects. And perhaps then we could start opening up and thinking about facilities which might be useful, like things that shell seeds and nuts, fridges where things can be kept, dryers, and lots more other ways in which facilities might be shared and, and used to make these remedies. So thanks for everybody listening. And thanks particularly to the Permaculture Association who supported this great big green community week and also permanent publications, my wonderful publishers.